sure as y'all know, I've uh, I've been locked up uh, six years, and um, it was tough. It was tough getting out. It was a lot of uncertainty. I'd never been in trouble with the law before, ever. Uh, and it wasn't because I was a good guy. It was because I got away with it. Right, you were good. Did it, did it away. And one of the things I've always, because I used to talk to prisoners um, while I was in, while I was locked up, especially the the young kids coming on to coming onto a farm, and I would tell them, I would always start off with, I'm a liar, cheat, and a thief. I've lied to everybody I've ever cared about or didn't care about, uh, and. You tell lies to cover up those lies, to support those lies, and pretty soon your whole life is a lie. I've cheated on everything from my taxes to the women that I've been with, and I'm a thief. I steal things from people. Uh, as a business owner, I would overcharge people's accounts. I, I was just, I was definitely not a decent man. But I would go to church, and I'd give my 10%, dress up real nice, make nice post on Facebook about how much I cared about people, but the reality was I was a very selfish, flawed man. So when I went to prison, there was the victim mentality. I played, you know, I said, you know, I can't believe God's done this to me. And uh, I hurt my kids a lot by not being around. So I had this horrible feeling that when I got out that I wouldn't be able to see my kids. And no matter how much I loved them and how much time I'd spent with them, I wouldn't get the relationship back. And for the last seven days, because I got out on the 23rd, for the last seven or eight days, um, Satan plays a really good mind game with you to tell you that you're not good enough. You'll never be a father again. So, <clears throat> he's a liar, was, brother. It was very good to get a text message from my son last night. Amen. <laughs> and he said, "Dad, I love you. Give me a call." So uh, today I will. Amen. Amen. Praise Amen. God. Romans nine twenty two. What if God, wanting to show His wrath and to make His power known? endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath prepared for destruction and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had prepared beforehand for glory even us whom he called not only of the Jews not of the Jews only but also of the Gentiles uh, and, and I, I want to kind of set this in context by reminding us that Pretty much all of the ninth chapter, the tenth chapter, and the eleventh chapter of Romans, Paul is is explaining why it is that, first of all, the Gentiles are entitled to to salvation through the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Jews also have to go through the Lord Jesus Christ to salvation. He's kind of making two points that, that go hand in hand. And we talked last week about, about how grateful, how grateful we need to be that, 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 that of all of the vessels of wrath that are out there, um, He has chosen us, at least if we're born again, filled with his spirit he's chosen us to be to be a vessel of glory um, or a vessel of mercy and and when we realize the, the pit the pit that God lifted us out of when he saved us that should just I mean that should just bring us to our knees every day and then when we look around and see how few and we mentioned the fact that over in the sixth chapter of of Isaiah God says his remnant will be a tenth. And so e even if that holds true through through time and through history and across Jews and Gentiles both, that means 90% of people are going to reject that offer of grace and spend eternity separated from God. And if we're not, um, we can't take credit from we can't take credit for that. We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God, and we should be so grateful. 
And in this verse, I also read that we should be very grateful that God just didn't just extend that gift to the Jews. You know, from the Jews came the prophets, from the Jews came the Old Testament, the Word, the Law, the, uh, the prophets, like I already said, and Jesus Christ himself. God brought all of that, brought all of his messages, brought the revelation of who he is, brought his word, and brought his Messiah into the world through his chosen people, the Jews. And the fact that we're not Jews, and yet God said, no, 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 no. I would that none should perish. I want you too. That's just another reason to rejoice. And in verse 25, Again, he's trying, to, uh, he's trying to convince his Jewish audience why they need to accept Jesus Christ as their Savior. Verse 25 says, As he says also in Hosea, I will call them my people who were not my people. That's us. That's the non-Jews. I will call them my people who were not my people and her beloved who was not beloved. And it shall come to pass in the place where it was said to them, You are not my people. There they, they shall be called the sons of the living God. Isaiah also cries out concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, the remnant will be saved, for he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, because the Lord will make a short work upon the earth. And as Isaiah said before, unless the Lord of Sebaoth, that means the Lord of hosts, had left us a seed, we would have become like Sodom and we would have been made like Gomorrah. Paul is going for the benefit of his Jewish audience is going back to the Old Testament and saying God said over and he just he just picking out a few verses he could pick out dozens and dozens of verses that talk about the fact that the vast majority of, of the Hebrews were destroyed for their unbelief. They were destroyed in the desert. They were destroyed, well, they weren't even Hebrews during the flood, but over and over and over again, God has destroyed unbelievers. And it is only those who live by faith that God receives. And it's been that from the very beginning of time, um, from Adam and Eve, all the way through John the Baptist, were saved by grace through faith and their sins were forgiven them because of the atoning blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody from Jesus Christ to the present day and until he returns again, if they are saved, they're going to be saved by grace through faith and because their sins are forgiven by the atoning blood of Jesus Christ. And very, very, very few of the Jews are going to fall into that category. And very few of the Gentiles are going to fall into that category but very few of the Jews and and Paul is going back to scripture to underscore that point for his readers for God's readers what then shall we say what shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness have attained to righteousness even the righteousness of faith but Israel pursuing the law of righteousness has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, as it were, but by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. 31. But Israel, pursuing the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Why? Because they did not seek it by faith, but as it were, by the works of the law. We're, we're, what we're talking about here is religion. Plain and simple. The, the Over generations and generations, the Jews had convinced themselves that what God wanted is for them to abide by the law of Moses, even though nobody could do it, that that was what they in fact they were so convinced that over in John 15 22 Jesus said, says had I not come and said to them the things that I said to them they would be without sin now he doesn't mean no Jew would have ever sinned but he but what he means was they were so convinced in their hearts that that's what God would wanted that that God would 
would take that into account in judging them. But now that I've come and told them, that's not what God wants. God doesn't want us sticking by the letter of the law. He wants us to understand God's intent. The letter of the law says, thou shalt not commit adultery. What God says, if you look at another woman, to check, and she's not your wife, to check her out, you're guilty. And, but Jesus says, had I not come and told them the things I told them, they would be without sin. But they were convinced, they were convinced that what God wanted was for them to stick to the law of Moses as, as best they could. And, and it's not just the Jews. The Jews are given to us as an example, but that can occur in any church. Um, and it's really easy to pick on the Catholic Church because the Catholic Church is notorious for having codified everything and for everything having turned into a bunch of rituals. Now, having said that, there are, going to be, there are plenty of Catholics who love the Lord and are filled with the Spirit of God and I, whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life. But as a, <coughs> as a, as a denomination, the Catholics have codified and, and ritualized an awful lot of what was intended to be a personal relationship with the Lord. But so have the Baptists, mm -hmm. and so have the Methodists. And, I mean, think of the word Methodist. <laughs> so have, so have the, the Pentecostals. And, and, and as I was thinking this week about this verse, I realized that, and Brother David has talked about this a few times, that what happens is that Oftentimes, someone will come along, like John Wesley, and filled with the Spirit of God, a gifted, called evangelist, and 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 will and because of because of his calling and his obedience to that calling, there will be a tremendous um, restoration. There will be a uh, a revival. But then the next generation comes along and they says, okay, 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 what did John Wesley say? Let's, we got to write down everything we can remember that he said because that's the magic formula. And in no time at all, we're right back to religion instead of a relationship with the Lord. And, and I think about the book of Judges. God would raise up somebody who would deliver Israel and everybody would fall in and say, yes, 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 we, 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 we repent. We've sinned against God. We've, we've been worshiping rocks and snakes and stars, and we repent. We're going to worship the one true God. And that, and that charismatic judge would pass away. And within a generation or two, everybody's right back to, you know, what they had been doing. And so Paul is saying, here's the problem is that you Jews, you Jews are not, you don't want to live by faith. You want this list of do's and don'ts. You want to say, that's what God wants. That's what I'm going to do. And, and you miss the boat in the process. Chapter 10, brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. Okay, that's 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 pretty blunt. He's saying to the to the Israelites, to his to his the people he grew up with, who raised him, who trained him, you're not saved. For I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Religion. It's religion. It's, you know, the Jews have, have decided among themselves what God wants instead of going to God and saying, God, what do you want? Um, Jesus even said, those who desire to do the will of God will know of my doctrine, whether it is from the Father or whether I'm just making this up. And, and my experience, especially in the jail ministry, my experience is, is that when someone gets desperate enough that they really want to know the truth, regardless of what the truth is, when they really, really, really want to know the truth, and they will pray and say, God, I don't know if you're real or not, 
but I desperately, desperately, desperately want to know. I really do want to, I want to know bad enough that if it turns out that this is the truth, I will live by it. But I, I need to know what the truth is. Would you reveal the truth to me? I'm going to say in my experience, 100% of the time, God speaks to them. God reveals himself to them. Um, I will have men come up to me and say, Ted, I just, I, I need, I mean, he said, you know, you know, I appreciate you coming and I hear what you're saying and it makes sense, but I, I need to know. And I'll say, well, don't worry about what I say. Go back to your bunk and pray your guts out. Just pray, say, God, I don't know if you're real or not. I, I want to know if you're real or not. I'm going to pick up your, I'm going to pick up this Bible. I'm going to start reading in the book of John. If God tells you to read a different book, read a different book. But I'm going to start reading, and, and, and I, I really want you to reveal myself. And almost invariably, a week later, maybe two weeks later, that man will come back and he'll say, Ted, you won't believe what happened. <laughs> Try me. Yeah. Try yeah. me. He says, God woke me up in the middle of the night, and he spoke to me, just like I'm speaking to you now. And he said, Jesus is my son. Place your trust in him. I don't know how many times I've heard that. Or, or, I've, or I've, prayed my, I've prayed my heart out and I've said, God, you know that I am, I am freaking out about my wife. I've not heard from my wife in six weeks. She hasn't called me. I think she's with another man. I think she's dumped me. I am absolutely freaking out. God, please, I need some help. And the words are no sooner out of my mouth than the phones ring. And it's my wife, and she's saying, I'm so sorry, I couldn't pay the phone bill. The phone got cut off for six weeks. I have borrowed Lisa's phone. I just had to call you. I just had to tell you I love you. Mm -hmm. and, 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 you know, nobody, nobody says, what a coincidence. Nobody says, and I've seen that over and over and over again. But, but what happens is, is if we decide that we're going to pick out what we like, or or if we're just going to believe what we've been told, what we grew up with. I believed what I learned, what I heard in the Methodist Church my whole life, with which, which was, if you will just let us baptize you, you will go to heaven. Now, that may not have been what the preacher was saying, but that's what I heard, and that's what I understood. And I got baptized at the age of 12, and for 30 years, I was completely convinced that I was going to heaven. God didn't have any choice in the matter. Because I got my head wet. And that's, that's what the Jews had done. That's what a lot of Christians do. Um, and, and again, um, Catholics, uh, Methodists, um, Episcopal, Episcopalians, Presbyterians. Um, I went to a, a funeral service at, a, at, a, at an Episcopal church uh, several years ago. And, and, and some, of, some of the rituals that they went through were so unbiblical, so, so totally unbiblical um, that I was amazed. But again, what happens is we just, fall into, we just fall into these traditions of men and pretty soon they're so comfortable and so easy to keep going back to that we just fall into those and we think that we think that we're play, pleasing God and we think that we're maintaining that relationship with God because we're continuing to go through those rituals. Having not submitted to the righteousness of God, chapter 10, verse 4, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Christ is not the end of sin. Sin is still sin is still sin. The things that God told us not to do, the things that he said we are not to do thousands of years ago are still sins. But what Christ has done is he has put an end to the law being the means by which we get saved. In fact, Jesus says over in Matthew, he says, I did not come to abolish the law, but to fulfill the law. Because under the law, the wages of sin is death. Um, under the law, the first time you deviated from the law, you were condemned. You could not, you couldn't, no one could live by the law. And the price 
for sin, the price for deviating from the law, was death. That is still the price. Fortunately, Jesus' death was sufficient to pay, to pay for all of our sins and for all of our deviations from what God has told us to do and not to do. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Unfortunately, for those who continue trying to live by the law, trying to be saved by the law, the Bible tells us that that, that is accounted to them as debt. Because all you can do is, every time you mess up, get farther in debt, farther in debt, farther in debt, farther in debt. And until you turn to Jesus Christ and place your faith and trust in Him and let His blood atone for your debt, you can't get out of debt. Cannot get out of debt without Jesus Christ. Verse 5, For Moses writes about the righteousness which is of the law. The man who does those things shall live by them. But the righteousness of faith speaks in this way. Do not say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down from above, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, that is the word of faith which we preach that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So when he says the word is near you in your mouth and in your heart, I am reminded of one of my very favorite verses which is in Jeremiah, Jeremiah 30:30, 30, 30, which so clearly clearly talks about the coming of the new covenant. I'm sorry, it's um, going to be verse chapter 31 verse 31. Jeremiah 31, 31 says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. But this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts and I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother saying know the Lord for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest of them says the Lord for I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. Now as Paul is about to remind us, this doesn't mean we don't need to spread the gospel. That doesn't mean we're not, that, that we don't need to tell people about the good news of the Lord Jesus Christ. What it means is that I don't have to teach my brother Randall what it means to be a Christian. I don't have to say, okay, you have to do this, you have to not do this, you have to... I, it's not like the law. Um, <laughs> brother, David, brother David talks about, um, you know, studying... Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and his head just spinning. He says, you could make a life's work out of trying to remember when you pour out the grain and when you pour out the oil and how much and if it's inside the, the gate and outside the gate, if it's in the outer temple, if it's in you could You could drive yourself nuts trying to memorize all of those rituals, all of those laws, all of those sacrifices. If you have the Holy Spirit in you, I don't need to tell you don't, I don't need to have someone tell me, and I don't need to tell somebody what's right and wrong, what's wrong. If we have the Holy Spirit in us, and we're led by the Spirit, the Spirit will guide us and direct us. The Word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the Word of faith. By faith, 
we receive the Holy Spirit by faith we have that word in our mouth and in our heart that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved for with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation and note that it's not enough to believe it is not enough to believe Jesus says if we are ashamed of him he shall be ashamed of us in front of his father who is in heaven we have to confess him and if we could read Greek we would understand that the verb tense that's used here doesn't mean I confess him once I can scratch that off my list. It means that confessing him, confessing him is something that I do. That the confession of the Lord is a regular part of my life. I am confessing. I am a confessor. Um, if somebody asks you, are you a swimmer? And you say yes. The implication is that you swim regularly. That's what this verb means. That you confess when you have the opportunity. It's not... I confessed him. I confessed him. I went down to the church. It was a day when there wasn't a whole lot of people there and I wasn't real embarrassed and I confessed him. And boy, I'm glad we got that over with. It is. I trust him. I believe him. I have his spirit in me. And when I see an opportunity to tell somebody that, I'm going to share that and not be ashamed of it. For with the heart one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. And that word confess, that word confess in the Greek means to repeat something that you know. In the legal sense, if you're confessing, that means I know I did it, or I know he did it. I know a confession is to repeat something that you know. And so when you confess Jesus Christ, what you're saying is, I know Jesus Christ. I know that he changed me. I know that I used to be down here. Now, he, God wants me up here and I'm not there, but I know I used to be in this pit. I know God took away my anger. I know God reconciled my family. I know God did this. I know God. And to confess is to repeat what you know. Brother David is fond of saying, if you don't have a testimony, don't share it. But if, but if you've been rescued from the pit, Shit. you have a testimony. Um, I, when, when, Rahana, <laughs> when Rahana first became a Christian, she said, and, and, and of course, I understand being timid when you're a new Christian because you don't, because it's so new. She said, I don't have a testimony. I said, oh, yes, you do. I said, nobody can say I don't have a testimony. Um, and even unbelievers have a testimony. It's just not a testimony that edifies the church. Um, for the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. Verse 12, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And I want to put these two verses together because because that's a wonderful verse. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. It is the word of God. It is the truth. But we read that and we think, oh, that's good. God, I'm in a pickle. Save me. But what it says is, how shall they call on them in whom they have not believed? So we can't call out in unbelief. That doesn't, that doesn't fit this. We call out in belief on a Lord that we believe in. How shall they believe in him um, in whom they have not heard? And y'all have heard me make this distinction before. I'm going to make it again. In the Greek, to believe in is different than to believe, just the same as it is in English. If the television were on right now and Hillary Clinton was speaking and I said, I believe her. You know what I mean. What I mean is, I don't think she's lying right now. And that's what I mean. If I said, I believe in her, it means something completely different. I would vote for her. I think pretty much everything she says is spot on. I'm in agreement with her. 
That's something completely different. The same with God. To say I believe, to say I believe in God is not, I believe that God exists. I grew up believing that. I grew up convinced that if I just believed that God existed, and it took me years to get there. I struggled with that. Is, is there really a God? Is there really a God? Yes, I believe there's a really God. Really a God. Whew, glad I got that over with. Check mark. The demons believe and have enough sense to shudder. To believe in means, and it clearly means this in the Greek as well as in the English, means that I not only believe that he existed, but I believe that the things he spoke were the truth. Which means I have to believe that not everyone who cries, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but only those who do his Father's will, my Father's will. I have to believe, I have to believe that only those who, the, the branches that don't bear fruit are cut off and stacked up to dry and cast into the fire. And only the branches that bear fruit, the branches, in fact, the branches that bear fruit are pruned, that they may bear more fruit. Well, I don't like being pruned. It doesn't matter that I don't like being pruned. That's the word of God. If I'm a believer, it also says if I'm a believer, I have at least one gift and that God's expectation is that I will use that gift to spread the gospel and to edify the church. If I believe in, if I call on the name of the Lord, then I have to be in agreement with all of this. But if I do, God doesn't say no to anybody. And I was convinced of that just because of reading the Bible. But my experience, my experience is that, that when somebody truly, truly, truly calls upon the name of the Lord. He changes them. Now, I've seen men pray the prayer of salvation and nothing changed. But I've seen men make that first time of confession of faith and obviously they meant it with all their heart. A week later they're back with the Bible and they are, they are bouncing off the walls. They're so excited about what they're reading, what they want to share, what they want to talk about. Their language has changed. Their demeanor has changed. Remember when Rudolph got home from jail? I mean, everybody was like, you know, there used to be a guy who lived in this community who looked just exactly like you. And he had the same name as you. But but can't, you can't be the same guys. Where's your brother at? You got a twin brother. Yeah, yeah. Where's, where's, where's that, where's that identical out. twin brother? What did you do to your identical twin brother? Um, and that's... We tried everything to make him a Baptist. <laughs> the spirit have your way. And we'll pick up here next week, but I just want to leave you with this thought. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And notice that preacher is lowercase. Um, we're not talking about somebody that we that we pay a couple hundred dollars a week to stand in the pulpit and pontificate every Sunday morning. We are talking about every single person. We're talking about confessing. When you get in front of somebody, when you have an opportunity and you confess, you are preaching. You are sharing the good news of Jesus Christ. And we're going to pick up there next week and really discuss not just the obligation. Um, I got so tickled yesterday. Um, uh, Emily and Hadassi and, and uh, Josiah were leaving. And uh, they were going and I said, see, see you tomorrow, Josiah. And he said, yeah, we have to come to church tomorrow. And Emily said, we get to come to church. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and it's, not, it's not that it's not, we shouldn't ever feel it. that, that I'm obligated mm -hmm. to share the gospel. It should be Seriously, God, you trust me? You trust me to do the work of your kingdom? How, how unbelievable is that? How wonderful is that? How joyful should I be that you trust me to do the work of your kingdom? Mm -hmm. And so we're going to pick up there next week. Does anybody else have something they want to add? Uh, I want to share just on what you, on what you just finished with about... Uh that we should be glad and, and, and joyful that we get to do it because I've been, like I said, I've been reading, I bought me another study Bible, so I've got two study Bibles and a couple other books that I'm reading all at one time, just wanting to know more. But just like what you said, like, 
he wants us to know like the uh, the joys and things like that. But the things that that we that we go through, like like just like what you're saying, is that that faith in that in that manner to to withstand and to want to keep to to want to keep going and to and to confess his name and to to be bold like that in them in that manner. But like you're saying, but we have to to submit to that spirit, and that means putting our flesh to death. And that and it's hard. For, for a lot of guys, like I said, for, for myself too, in, in, in my walk, but I know that that I have to keep going. I have to keep I have to keep confessing. I have to keep doing what he's calling me to do because that's what I believe now. When I was a, when I was a convict and when I would sell dope and I would do, I I believed that I was that 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 was my mentality. So just like what you said, well, you you say you're a swimmer, well, you practice swimming. Well, you say that you're that you're a comic, you're this bad guy. Well, you do bad things that make you that bad person. Well, now that I believe in Christ and I confess His name, well, I've got to do things that are going to show that I'm a Christian, and it has to be to the extreme because that's what the Holy Spirit does. I don't want to be a Christian and then live my life just the same way everybody else is. Don't want to be lukewarm. Yeah, I don't. I don't, I don't want to do that. <laughs> I want to be like my wife put a post on Facebook. I want to be so on fire for God that when I come in contact with somebody. It's so hot that they get engulfed with the flames, that they get set on fire because of how how much the Holy Spirit is in me that it can't help but pour out into the others. That's that's the Holy Spirit that we got. But at the same time, like you said, we have to confess that. At the same time, I have to put that faith into action to confess, to witness, to testify, to preach, to minister, to do all the things. The Holy Spirit's given me that capability. Now it's okay, so... Am I going to submit my flesh to the spirit and let the spirit move me? Or am I going to quench that spirit and then do what my flesh wants?